Hi, I see a few attendees coming in here. People are starting to come in slowly. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I just want to let everyone know we're having some connection issues um, trying to connect with Vanessa. She is in um, she's in Uganda and um, she's having some uh, network failure. So we've just been working on that. Those tech issues. Oh, that's what's here. Wonderful. Hello. Hi, Vanessa. Hello. Hello. Hi. It is a pleasure to see you. So um, we're going to get started soon. Um, Vanessa, are you able to hear us? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Welcome. Um, welcome, Thank everyone. Um, I'll start off by just saying that um, if there are more connectivity issues throughout the show, we apologize. Um, this is being broadcast from um, the East Coast of the U.S., the West Coast of the U.S., and, um, and Kampala, Uganda. Uh, this is the 10th episode of the Hunger for Justice series. Um, we'll be populating the links, um, links in the chat box with different resources um, throughout the conversation. Um, and the last 20 minutes of the conversation will be open for question and answer. So please submit any questions that you have into the Q&A box. And Vanessa will be um, answering them, those at the end of the, um, the last 20 minutes of the session. This is also being recorded and will be uploaded for public viewing on the AGC YouTube channel. So if you have registered for this episode, you'll be getting that link, um, as well as a link to our weekly community dialogue, um, where we hold space, hear voices, and reflect on the knowledge we're all learning about here. Uh, that's on Mondays at noon. A Growing Culture is a nonprofit organization advancing a culture of farmer autonomy and agroecological innovation, and we thank you for joining us today. You'll now be hearing a few introductory words from Lauren Cardelli, founder of A Growing Culture. Thank you, Julia. Um, such a pleasure to be here today. The 10th episode of the Hunger for Justice series. It has been an incredible journey. Um, I want to share a, a story um, real briefly to introduce the, um, today's segment. There, um, at the end of 2019, there was a German agro biz, agro tech kind of firm that developed this technique to, to sex an egg, right? And for throughout agricultural history, we haven't known how to determine whether an egg was going to be a male or a female. And this was so important because in Germany alone, 45 million male chicks a year are, are culled. And that's a massive amount of chicks that could have been brought to, to a farm and raised as broilers. Um, and so this German firm developed this technique. It's high cost. They put a syringe into the egg and they pull it out. They extract the DNA. They're able to test, right? Um, it's high cost, and, but it was like still recognized as this amazing innovation. And it was broadcasted. I mean, New York Times, Fortune, everybody was reporting on it. And it was this major breakthrough. And I couldn't believe it because since 2011, Christine Colonzo in Kitui, County, right? In Kenya. She developed the technique to sex and aid. This technique is on YouTube. It's open source. And it was worked and, and, and supported through a partner of ours, Pro Lenovo. And farmers across East Africa are now using this technique. And it's spread and it's open source and it's free. And what she did was she realized a way to map the curve. And judging by the curve, she could tell if it was male or female. They brought in researchers, and it was 90% effective. But yet, this woman in Africa didn't get recognized for this innovation. A bunch of white male 
German scientist got recognized. This is a story that has been repeated a million times. Systemic whitewashing and racism that exists throughout our society and even in the environmental movement. The truth is that Africa contributes the least to global warming, but is one of the most vulnerable places to climate change. This paradox, which should be shocking, may not be, however, because of the systemic racism and colonization that still exists within our society. Whether we are talking about solutions to mitigating climate change or innovation to transform rural economies to new models of thinking, Africa has been at best ignored, but the truth is systemically erased from the narrative. The work that Vanessa Nakate is doing is nothing short of extraordinary. Her movement has grown into a global response manifesting into millions of voices and activists across the world. Why? because her story resonates deeply with activists of color the world over. She is the founder of Youth for Future Africa and the Rise Up Movement. Vanessa has organized and campaigned for climate initiatives across the continent, including protecting rainforests in Congo, which she recently posted an image of her holding a sign with a quote from Brazilian activist Chico Mendes, saying, at first I thought I was fighting to save a tree. Then I was fighting to save a rainforest. Now, I realize I am fighting for humanity. It is my great honor to pass the mic to Andrew Baskin, a worker owner of Lyft Economy and Next Economy Now podcast. Andrew cultivates a liberatory praxis of centering historically marginalized communities rooted in the pursuit of self-determination and cultural healing with a focus on regenerative agriculture, food systems, ownership of land and labor, social enterprise, and holistic design. Andrew previously served on the Board of Agricultural Sustainability Institute at UC Davis while earning his degree in sustainable agriculture and food systems, pioneering original resource as McNair Scholar with departmental honors. I cannot be more excited for the conversation these two activists and leaders will be having. So without further ado, Andrew. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, it's a really great, privilege and pleasure to be a uh, part of this series and to be talking to Vanessa Nakate today. So thank you for this opportunity and really want to just prioritize um, shining the spotlight on Vanessa right now. And uh, so let's just, let's, let's dive in, shall we? <laughs> um, so welcome, Vanessa. Let's bring your voice in. Um, it's a it's a it's a pleasure to have you on this series and maybe let's start with um, a bit about your background. Can you share some of your story and um, and maybe from there we can flow into why you have become a climate activist just to give folks a bit of background. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm so happy to be chatting with you as well. Um, my name is Vanessa Nakate, and I'm a climate activist. Uh, basically, my background has been, hasn't really had activism in it. It has been mostly education, and um, I've been through primary school, secondary school, and last year I graduated from university. And I studied. <laughs> Thank you. I studied uh, business. Much uh, about my background. Cool and home. Nothing much. No activism. Got it. It was it was cutting out just a tiny bit there, but I got I got most of it. Um, yeah. So curious, maybe to to hear a, a little bit about just how like you know you're an incredible climate activist leading <laughs> an international um you know movement of folks right now and just kind of curious for those who might not be familiar to get a little bit more context about um you know what's happening in uganda that 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 has driven you to take this action and really put yourself out there in this way well, um, I remember my activism started, I could say, in 2018 because 
because it was in 2018 that I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my country. Therefore, I started carrying out research to understand the problems that many of these people faced. And I was really surprised to find that I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems. So I decided to read more about it and to get to know the causes because in school it was taught as something um, just the, the climate crisis was taught as something that either happened in the past or something that is coming in the far um, something that we don't have to worry about. So I decided to read more about it and get to know the impacts and, uh, and the... When I realized that there were communities in my... facing uh, devastating impacts of climate change, that is when I decided to start activism. Now, when it comes to my country, it's a country that heavily depends on its natural resources as a form of survival. And many of the people in Uganda, they heavily depend on agriculture. When I say agriculture, I am talking about subsistence farming. And with the increasing global temperatures, we are seeing the patterns are being disrupted and Farmers no longer receive rain when they're supposed to. I mean, the dry spells are... The climate crisis is really causing a threat of food scarcity and water scarcity for the people in my country. It's depend on the food that they grow. Their children, their children's education depends on the food that they sell. And with all these, you know, distractions with the climate disasters, many people are being left with nothing for their livelihoods. When we go to the Western part of the country, it has been completely destroyed by floods because of the increase in water levels of many rivers, causing their banks to burst. When you come to the central part of the country, Lake Victoria's water levels and many people's homes, farms are being destroyed as well. When you go to the northern part of the country, the people are being, by increasing dry spells, in that they are having any access to water. And when it comes to the eastern part of the country, this has been and landslides in the Mount Elgon area. So looking at all these impacts that, come, that are coming in from different parts of the country, I realized how much the people, and I decided that I had to be a voice for the people of my country to try and get justice, to try and get resilience for their communities so that they stop having to experience these devastating impacts of When these disasters occur, many of them are left homeless. Many of many children stop to go to school because it is the food that their parents to pay their school expenses. We, are, we have so many street children in Kampala, but most of these street children, they are from the Northern part of the country. They are running away from their homes with their mothers because they're looking for a better way of survival. Unfortunately, when they come to Kampala, they don't receive what they expect. They have to stay on the streets to beg for survival. sad and 
it's very disturbing to see that even children have to face these impacts of Many of them are being subjected to diseases because when their homes flood, their toilets are submerged as well. Many children are being subjected to waterborne diseases, increasing the death rates of children below five years old. Climate change is destroying lives at a very fast rate. It is killing many people at a very, very high rate. If I could talk about the country, it would literally take me the whole day to explain the primary effects that come with the floodings, with the landslides, with the droughts. Primary effects that come after a family experience how education is affected, how peace is affected in the community. Because I mean, the more the resources become limited, the more the struggle for these resources. Looking at all these challenges that the people facing that I had to do something about it. I decided to start striking for climate in the first week of January, 2019. The people in my country get justice because as Lauren has said, Africa is the least emitter of carbon, but the African countries are being a climate crisis. And I believe this is why, this is why I became a climate activist, to ensure that everyone can have access to a better and healthier future. Yeah, yeah, and um, just to check in, I like we are still having uh, some connect. I'm hearing most of what you're saying, but just just to reflect back, it's um, just the message that you're sharing is is so so important. So we're going to continue this conversation, um, but really want to um, you know this the message that Vanessa is sharing is is shared across a number of platforms. So want to encourage and invite folks um, if you're missing kind of details here and there, what's happening to maybe fill in the gap by, um, you know, <clears throat> looking at the, the myriad of other sources that uh, have shared um, Vanessa's work and Vanessa's story. Um, but we're gonna continue working with uh, what we've got here. So Vanessa, yeah, and I'm, I'm first of all, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge you uh, for, as, as a woman, as a youth, as a person of color, for standing up and taking on and, and em embracing the courage that it takes to stand up for and face uh, a litany, uh, uh, <laughs> an overwhelming amount of, of challenges that you uh, and the communities that surround you are facing. Um, and it's not I mean the, the, the theme for a lot of your work is is climate. But there's there's challenges that are are layered on top of each other. There's uh, the the climate challenges that that you're facing, which are just the ecological, and then those, you know, as you're saying, are affecting people's livelihoods. So then people can't you know make access the needs that they have, um, and then also throughout all of this, right? You're 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 facing systemic racism um both um <laughs> just you know just there was one particular uh incident that that was brought to light that i want to bring forward in this moment um that kind of highlighted the lack of diversity in environmental activism or really better said um some of the systemic racism and uh you know, cutting people out of the story. And so Vanessa, you were cropped out of a photo alongside some of your peers uh, demonstrating at the World Economic Forum this year. Many people know the name Greta Thunberg. Um, she was in that photo as well. Um, and 
not only were you cropped out of the photo, but but much of the the story, which you were, some of which you were just sharing now, was also, uh, you know, invisible. It, it, you couldn't you couldn't really see it, and so you had turned to Twitter, you know, to the to your community to pose a question to to these media groups who posted these photos and these news articles. Why did you remove me from the photo? Um, you had appeared at a joint press conference with other prominent climate activists, um, as I mentioned, including Greta Thunberg, and yet none of your comments were included and you were not on the official list of participants. So wanted to just um, give you opportunity to, to speak a little bit to this other factor of systemic racism that you're dealing with and how that's intersecting with your work. And, and also, I'm curious, maybe you can um, speak a little bit about specifically what you were demanding and demonstrating uh, for at the World Economic Forum in Davos earlier this year. So you could, you could take either one of those directions, share what you're speaking about in that context and or, you know, some of the uh, erasure <coughs> of your story that happened following that. Well, um, at the beginning of this year, I was invited to the World Economic Forum and I was to attend the Arctic Base Camp. And basically, um, at this base camp, I was hoping to pressure the leaders into seeing how much the young people are doing, how much they're sacrificing. Because at this base camp, we were sleeping out intense and we all knowing them that um, we have left the uncomfort the comfortable uh, to show you that now is the time for for you to do the uncomfortable things that will help us save the planet and uh, I remember on Friday I had the opportunity to take part in the press conference with other climate activists and um, that was great uh, looking at this conference. Um, I talked so much about how the African voices were struggling so much to be heard and to be listened to when it comes to the climate movement. And um, I remember telling the media to stop being so biased. When Unfortunately, my words must have fallen on deaf ears, found myself uh, in this article, and I don't even know, I don't remember how I found it, but I just landed on it, and I decided to read about the difference. When I saw the first photo that appeared on the article, at first I thought that uh, it could fit the, to see um, if it was a problem of size that I couldn't show up in the article, I think headline, I would say. And when I got to the article, of course, uh, I was really broken to find that picture, but then I could see a part of my jacket and that was really, really frustrating because when I saw a part of my jacket, I automatically knew that I had been cropped out. So I decided to read this article and still, unfortunately, and at some point I felt like I had wasted my time at the press conference and I felt like all the efforts to You know, travel a very international community, listen to the cries and how people as I thought about the other activists who hadn't got those opportunities to speak directly to international community and how much they have been struggling to really talk about their, what is happening in their countries. And uh, all that just brought 
tears to my eyes yet to be at the press conference, but still, even at that place, my voice was erased. And this showed something that has been happening for a very, very long time. And um, when I reacted to that photo and I asked why I had been cropped out voices in Africa saying that they're not being listened to so when I saw the photo I felt like now this is the time to actually get answers from these people and to understand why they keep doing this so that is what really motivated me to ask and I was I was with the other activists. There's no other reason for cropping for cropping me out except uh, the racism that we see in the environmental sector. And it is sad that those whose voices are least heard, those who are struggling so much to tell their stories, these are the people who are the most affected in their community, in their homes. But then how can they get justice for their communities if their voices are continuously being erased and buried? So this kind of racism in the environmental movement or in any other area in life, this is something that needs to come to an end because we cannot achieve climate justice without addressing the issue of racial justice, you know? The communities that are affected the most, they are the least emitters of carbons. Most of the black communities, they're the ones who live in areas with dumping sites, with waste sites. I mean, they are more prone to air pollution than the rest of the people. And this is very disturbing. I believe that every, we won't be able to get the justice that we need if we continue Overlooking these people are dying, these people's livelihoods are being destroyed. But with continuous discrimination and racism in the climate movement, we will not be able to achieve this. And trust me, this is something that that hasn't been dealt with yet. But we hope that it is something that, you know, we can see phase away. You know, a friend of mine recently was telling me, some time back was telling me that they were trying to read about me. On, I think, uh, Google, and they were really surprised. me as an as activist who has cropped out, you know, the photo activists, some of them refer to me like, it erases the actual message that I am trying to pass on, that other activists in my country and in the African continent are trying to pass on. And this is something that we need to address. We cannot achieve environmental justice without achieving racial justice because the people in our communities are suffering. They have been pushed to point of food scarcity. They have been pushed to point of airborne diseases like cholera. Most of them are losing their children below five years at a very, very high rate. You know, many children are stopping to go to school because their families cannot take care of, you know, the expenses that they have to incur in school. I was reading an article last talking about children rights, whereby Af some African parents give up their girls, teenage girls for marriage because they have lost everything. They cannot take care of the whole family. So they rather give out some of the children for marriage, get some bread price that can help them recover. We cannot continuously see these things happen and then erase the voices that are rising up from those communities. We are tired of seeing street children in our countries. We are tired of seeing all these disasters that have been brought about by climate change. You know, many people do not understand the intensity of the climate crisis. You can only feel this intensity if you're living in an African country. And it's sad that those who, you know, carry the decision 
regions that will help us uh, get rid of the, the, the haven't really failed and um, many of them have not seen how people suffer or it's an issue of, of value you know because I, I had no value and my voice didn't really matter that's why I was cropped out and it really questions how to value us but then I thank Everyone who came out and supported, I thank um, yeah, who are so helpful because at the end of the day, we come out stronger and we are continuously holding them accountable for the climate crisis that we are in right now. Yeah, yeah. And what, I mean, what's... I think what's presenced through this experience that, that you're sharing is, uh, you know, the, the backdrop context of a, a paradigm of systemic white supremacy that runs across the globe that has been erasing uh, African uh, and African diaspora contributions to humanity for a very long time. Uh, so perhaps it was only a matter of time but still, I, I, in hearing you talk about your experience with this, it's not like, you know, in growing up in Uganda, you had experienced kind of the everyday racism that, you know, maybe folks experience in other parts of the country. But, but this kind of was like a new experience of systemic racism for you. Yeah. And um, yeah, so in your in your reaction um, to the lack of acknowledgement of your demonstrating, you shared that, um, I believe you said Africa is the least, and you said this earlier in the conversation, Africa is the least emitter of carbon, yet the most affected by the climate crisis. And in particular, you said you erasing our voices won't change anything. I'm wondering if you could speak more about that. Well, um, when I say that erasing our voices won't change anything, I basically mean that we are going to continue advocating for change. We are going to continue for change because we see what is happening in our communities. We see what is happening in our countries. And we people in our countries suffer as a result of the climate crisis, we shall continue speaking up. Because to me, I feel like if someone raises your voice, they are literally uh, telling you to, you know, they're literally making you give up in a way. They are literally reducing your value. They're making your value. They're making you question your activism. They're making you question your voice. And, um, I personally will not give them the satisfaction of, of making myself feel like I'm less of value or I don't really matter or my voice doesn't really matter. Because the moment we give in to believing what other people make us think we are, then we are heading to destruction or who are being affected so best way I can put it we cannot be silenced regardless of the erasure that continuously happens because if we accept to be silenced then we will be burying our own selves in the ground and I personally don't believe in that so I will continue speaking up I'll continue advocating I'll continue demanding for change because I know at the end of it all the people in my country the people in the African continent, in the global south, those who are experiencing all these disasters, they'll get to see a ray of light. I usually say this, every activist has a story to tell and every story has a solution to give and every solution has a life to change. So whatever happens, we are continuously going to tell these stories. We are continuously going to give solutions. We are
continuously going to make sure that someone else achieves Thanks for that. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, when, when our backs are up against the wall, there's not really, there's not really an option. And yeah, it's, it's evident, self-evident by what you're seeing um, on the ground around you every day that, you know, it's not, it's not an option. And uh, I want to just remind uh, folks tuning in that we're going to be shifting to uh, a more of a Q&A format um, shortly to take questions from the audience. So just friendly reminder to share questions that are coming up for you for Vanessa. Um, but Vanessa, building on what you just shared and, and thinking towards, we focused a lot in the conversation so far on um, the challenges that are deeply present both globally and in U and in Uganda, um, and how you are how you've been working to address that on the international stage, and of course your work has continued in that space. And so, focusing more on the solutions side of this conversation, um, I want to bring in. Um, kind of climate voices sharing the stories of climate activists in Africa. Can you share your vision for um, this initiative that you've started around 1 million activist stories? Uh, uh, well, um, the vision, um, when it comes to the climate solutions part, um, I started a project that involves the installation of solar energy and uh, eco-friendly stoves in schools. And um, basically, I started this project to help out um, the schools in rural communities to be able to transition easily uh, to renewable energy at no cost at all. And then for the eco-friendly stoves, this uh, basically reduced on the amount of firewood that the students or the schools use in uh, preparation of food. And this is a form of, you know, uh, reducing on the deforestation rates in these rural communities. And also it is a learning experience um, for the teachers, for the students and for their parents. And uh, this basically teaches them the importance of preservation and conservation of our environment, of our planet, of our nature. So with this project, I hope to cover as many schools as possible because I want to be a more than just activist who, who you know, creates our communities. Mm -hmm. And I hope to... Uh, have as many schools as possible and make sure that the transition of this renewable energy and the eco-friendly stoves runs in schools and households as well. And uh, I also have a project to help amplify the voices of different activists um, across the world, Africa and Asia of the world. And, um, I have interviewed some one million activist stories, and uh, of course we hope to tell as a everyone's story matters. I don't understand what someone from India faces when it comes to climate change, so I need to hear hear it from them and the world needs to hear it from them from Kenya experiences so I will need to hear it from them I may not understand what someone from uh, maybe Sweden and or German experiences so we need to hear it from them that is the, the vision for the one million activist stories to cover as many many stories as possible and to share these stories to different platforms so that people can get to
to know. Not sure if you can hear me, Vanessa, but it, it froze there for a second. Maybe if, are you able to hear me? Oh, I see you. Can you hear I can if, if you, me? Yeah, great. I can hear you now. So maybe just just if you could roll it back a little bit, just well, so um, I hear what you said. As, when did you last? Uh, okay. <laughs> I was talking about this project that I hope to start working even in moments of our domestic kids. So this is a project that I would say is in the pipeline. I hope that uh, it can start as soon as possible so that we can provide people with a water harvesting mechanism financed by the internet. Uh, it will be the same for this uh, water harvesting project. And uh, anyone who is led to you know, help out or donate in any way, that will be a great way to kickstart the project and be able to see that these communities have resilience. You know, we may not get the action now, the climate doesn't stop us from building resilience because people are suffering now and we have to make sure that they are able to recover, that their lives are able to continue, that they are able to, you know, live happily and not give up their children for we have resilience in these communities. Yeah, and you shared just a moment ago how folks, how listeners might be able to support either through donating and just want to, where can folks go to, to learn more to, uh, and what, what can uh, folks do to support that effort? Like, is there a website maybe? Uh, well, for uh, you can find it at the one million activist stories and the Twitter account and other projects. Um, it's kind of impossible to create and why still some of the things that we need to really change because. If I'm to create it, some and uh, you know, I'll have to get the donations through that person. So that is that is kind of a challenge right now. But um, we can do that through PayPal. I could share a PayPal. We can work with that. Uh, for PayPal, it's still a friend helping me out, and I trust them with the management of the money. But then uh, it is important to maybe include that this money is maybe for the stoves or for for the water harvesting mechanisms, because I was using that PayPal to receive some money for for. COVID relief, uh, something else that I've been working on in this period. But um, but if I'm to share the PayPal link, then it's uh, very, very advisable to just um, put something, either it's for the COVID relief food uh, or it's for, for the stove project and solar or it's for the water uh, harvesting mechanism. Got it. That's super helpful. Thanks, Vanessa. And um, I think we just shared in the chat the website um, one million activists.org, the number one million activist stories.org. Um, 
And uh, that link and the PayPal links that Vanessa just shared will be uh, sent in a follow-up email. So now you, a moment ago, you were speaking to kind of the importance of servicing, of, of bringing forward all of these, you know, stories on the ground of, of people experiencing the stories from, you know, around, around the world, um, and especially uh, those voices who are maybe a little bit harder to hear. Um, and I think one question that, that I'm curious about is, is, you know, thinking about the ecological nature that all of these folks are facing, and in particular, you in Uganda, you, you talked about um, kind of the uh, moving back and forth between weather extremes. You talked about the intense floods um, uh, that are overwhelming, followed by periods of intense drought. And it brings to mind, um, I know that there's been some energy going into the space of regenerative agriculture. And so uh, I'm curious to hear from you your thoughts on what, uh, especially kind of this being the, the hunger for change series and focused on, you know, a, a soil and food system based kind of uh, approach to solutioning some of these problems. Curious to hear your thoughts on, on what role agriculture, regenerative agriculture can play in relationship to um, some of this, this climate crisis. For example, are there ways that, you know, folks can maybe uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the, I don't know the specifics of the context in Uganda, but just, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me is in the context of that, of that moving from extreme to extreme, from droughts to floods, are there ways to uh, reduce that level of polarity by maybe, um, you know, I think, I don't know, so some folks might be familiar with the idea of bioswales or, or sinking water, and maybe it's just at a scale where that's not even doable um, in the short term, but um, I think I'm maybe injecting <laughs> some of my own thinking into this question here, but, but yeah, curious to hear what role um, agriculture, regenerative, regenerative agriculture can play in relationship to this climate crisis in Uganda and in general. Looks like you're you. Um, it looks like you're still muted, Vanessa. I'm not sure if you're. Um, there we go. Or, Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now. That's great. Oh, sorry. Must have been the connection. Well, um, okay. agriculture plays plays a very very big role when it comes to um, the, the climate issues. And, you know, we understand that agriculture uses so much of, you know, the water that we need. And um, in some way, uh, it contributes to the climate crisis. Food is an important, you know, issue that we cannot live without. So we have to find other to ensure that uh, people can still have access to food while also having the environment and uh, I would say the climate protected in uh, regenerative agriculture because um, we need to make sure that the soils are protected as much as possible because at the end of the day if the soils are weak then we are going to have um, much uh, let me say if our, if our community experiences a flood then that means every crop is going to be uh, washed away so making sure that um, the top soils are protected as much as possible and making sure that and making sure that uh, 
cover crops are used as much as possible. Uh, this can also, you know, help us in ensuring that enough water is kept in the soils. That even in a in a scenario of a drought or a heavy dry spell, the the crops can still have access to water. The crops can still be able to grow, and um, it will. It also reduces so much of the farm waste because most of the times people dispose of the farm waste but if we have much more of uh, this farm waste brought back and you know uh, used maybe as the fertilizers uh, in the crops and in the soils this will help to ensure that um, people still have access to food uh, even in in a case of a climate disaster like drought uh, the soils have enough water the soils are strong enough and the crops can still be able to grow and uh, Uh, so is that are able to keep a uh, much more water parts of the floods that people experience so I personally believe that averting the climate crisis because at the end of it all well, uh, it uses you know to some of the emissions so this is something that we can work on by uh, embracing regenerative agriculture so that we ensure that uh, the top soil is pr protected we ensure that the soils can be able to keep as much water as possible we ensure that have evidence on the impact of soil erosion, you know, in case of heavy rains. Personally, believe that uh, regenerative agriculture is, in one way or another, will help us solve some of the issues of the climate crisis. Great. I think, um, I'm not sure if we, Vanessa, are you still with us? I think we may have time for just one uh, question from the community here. So thank you for sharing your response to that. That was really, really insightful. So looking to potentially regenerative agriculture as um, an ecological solution and potentially perhaps um, if the incentives can be aligned, maybe a response to some of the challenges with livelihoods. So bringing forward one of the questions from the folks tuning in, how are you, uh, how, how have you and how are you currently working with um, local government institutions, local institutions, and what has the response been so far? Uh, well, when it comes to local governments, um, I don't know if you're talking about those in the rural communities or oh, you were talking about uh, generally the local governments, the, the, uh, the Ugandan government itself. When it comes to local governments, some of them, I have worked with them uh, through this project of solar and uh, the stoves, because uh, you cannot take some of these projects without you know, talking to the, the local leaders of the community. At the end of the day, they want to know why you're, you're bringing that project. They don't want to feel like you are dominating them and, you know, taking over their community. So that is one of the ways that I've worked with them because I've had to explain to them why we are doing these installations and why they need them as a community. And the response has always been good uh, when it comes to To, to the local leaders and um, in these communities where we've done. But then the, 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 the Ugandan government, I haven't got any kind of a reaction from them or response. I've tried as much as possible to reach out to them, but it's uh, very complicated, especially if you just are a young person, you know, getting to the parliament and, you know, top leaders is really hard. They're literally up here and... We are literally down here, so that has been a challenge.
Got it. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to both sides of that question. <clears throat> and uh, I think maybe we have time for uh, one or two more questions, fortunately. So the question is, who, who are your heroes and mentors that have inspired you and in your work? Who are you looking to for inspiration? Who's, who's mentored you and been a, a hero or heroine for you along the way? Um, well, I would say that my heroes are my parents and then um, my mentors. I've really learned a lot from uh, the activists that I've worked with because I believe that they always have ideas that I don't have. They always have suggestions that I don't have. So I would say that my mentors have been uh, my fellow activists in my country that I've closely worked with to make sure that we continuously demand for justice and uh, to make sure that uh, these projects that we are working on uh, are moving on smoothly. But if I'm to point out some of the, the mentors who really inspired me to join this movement, that was uh, Greta and uh, Greta Chinbag and Jamie Magolin. Shout out, wow. shout out to all those folks. And uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and hand it back to Lauren. Um, take it thank on. you. Thank, thank you. That was um, so incredible. Um, I can't even begin to explain the emotion that I'm feeling, Vanessa, you are um, one of a kind. And it's just, it's such an honor and an opportunity, you know, an honor to have you here with us to, to listen to your story um, and to hopefully explore ways that we can work together in the future. Um, too often, people look for to Silicon Valley, to Wall Street, to Iowa State or Cornell for the solutions. Um, when there, the reality is that you, can, you couldn't be further away from where those solutions are happening. And, and Vanessa is just an incredible reminder to us all that maybe we should start in the communities most affected, right? These communities that are mitigating and dealing with these economic and social injustices as well as a rapidly changing climate. Um, it's time for us as, as a Western audience to, to not pretend that we live in a silo, <laughs> to not ignore the reality of the world and our bias and our privilege and, and, and work as hard as we can to support individuals in the global South like Vanessa. So thank you so much, Vanessa. I cannot express enough how grateful I am um, to be collaborating with you today. I think because of time, what's most important is if we would um, allow Andrew and Vanessa to both have a closing have statement. Have been part of this? Andrew, do you want to start and then Vanessa will finish? Sure, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say, Vanessa, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. And also, it's so beautiful to see to see your smile. And yeah, you are so beautiful. Uh, you know, in the work that you are doing, the way that you're showing up, you know, and I know to some degree, it kind of feels like you have no choice. But at the same time, I want to just acknowledge and celebrate um, you and, and, and your work um, sincerely. And <clears throat> I think I heard earlier on in the conversation that, you know, you recently graduated from college studying, I think you said business. Um, so I will just, you know, put it out there. My team at Lyft Economy, um, that is a space that we operate in. Yes. And I think from a similar place of similar values. Um, and so I would just love to follow up with you offline um, to see if there's ways that we might be able to support you in your journey. Um, and to the listeners of the show, thank you so much for tuning into this show. Um, uh, yeah, um, I don't want to, I would be, I would love to share more and, and want to also respect people's time um, and give Vanessa the floor to share your closing thoughts. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Vanessa. Well, uh, 
well on this conversation and uh, um, I'm glad that I honestly apologize for the unmanageable circumstances when it comes to connection because um, it's an issue that just really happens uh, sometimes when you don't expect it, it must be the generally, I apologize for that and it was really out of my hand to handle it. You know, I, I hope that you were able to understand what the people in my country, in the African, you know, continent are going on and I'm really glad that, you know, you're able to join the you know, the hunger for justice series, it is something that is so, you know, powerful. When Lauren first reached out to me, I was really impressed by the work that they're doing because at the end of the day, it is the farmers that are affected the most. And it is the farmers who, you know, they're the ones to grow the food that we eat and we need to value them we need, we need to make sure that their hard work is not put to waste so I'm really happy that I was able to be part of this series and I appreciate Lauren and uh, all those who are watching, thank you so much oh, Thank you so much Vanessa, it's been a pleasure and Andrew um, Thank you so much for moderating, and for asking brilliant questions and for helping us shape this conversation. Um, please, everyone, check out SwiftEconomy.com. Um, the Next Economy Now Pro um, podcast is up there. Um, check it out. You can explore more of Andrew's brilliant work. Um, we will be sending out resources to everyone. We'll be putting up online and through our social media channels um, ways to connect with Vanessa, um, Nate, ways to connect with Andrew, and ways to continue the dialogue going forward. Every Monday, we have community sessions. Please sign up um, for our newsletter, and you will get the link. So those sessions is an open door for our community to come and engage with each other. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors, you know, Milgram Dascom Law Firm, as well as Eat Your Way Clean. They help make this program possible. Thank you so much. Um, and please consider supporting the growing culture in these series. You can text GROW to 850-600-2996 or go to growingculture.org slash donate. We do the best that we can to support the groups on the ground. Um, and we can't be more grateful for the opportunity today to speak with both Andrew and Vanessa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. It was a privilege. Thank you, everyone. We are closing out here. Um, the recording will be available. And um, Andrew, thank you. Vanessa, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we will speak soon. You too. Thanks, Julia.